characters stand inside. We're actually doing Lord of the Rings. Directors and tiny houses, tiny houses. Houses, remodeling houses. Um, basically. It's not a rather Something that other people call you. I don't call myself as, a cover. As everyone. I am Matesh Sharma, Managing Editor at Home Crux Magazine. We've been covering design, architecture, and production design for quite some time and have interviewed many eminent personalities with the likes of Donald Burt, who is a two-time production design Oscar-winning production designer, Grant Major, Alex McDowell, Paul D. Usterberry, and many others. And it is indeed a great pleasure to have you with Home Crux today. So how is your day going? How's the weather in UK? Uh, the weather is changeable. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it was it is. Raining, raining this morning but sun is shining now so i'm not sure how long that will last that's that's the thing in the uk yeah all right first yeah. of all again uh congratulations on your big oscar win one thing i'd like to ask you is that is it a thing in hollywood that one has to keep a note in their pocket irrespective of one wins or not because you and shona had that acceptance speech ready as soon as you stepped on stage or was it that you two were really confident of taking both bafta and oscar home uh we we didn't have uh the os after we um we had the we had the piece of paper and um the well we won four the art directors guild award we were completely unprepared for because we didn't expect to and then the bafta which was the following week we wrote a speech and read it between us and then the british film designers guild again we uh, wrote a speech and then come to the Oscars we were like we've done this now this will be the fourth time we really need to nail this this is the biggest stage so we we didn't we wrote something the day before which wasn't too dissimilar to the BAFTAs and then we just decided that we would ad lib it um, because it would be more interesting because when we're just speaking normally it's it's always always more interesting than just um uh, off a uh, subscribed you know we we can't you know so we just went we decided that we would wing it so there was no bits of paper in our pockets for the oscar speech that there, there may have been a version on the phone but we just and it's so quick you know there's a clock going dick, 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 dick. yes so you got to get out there and do it it's you know crazy. Of, of all the production designers I talk to, a very few of them are educationally groomed as you are because you did your master's in production design for TV at film at Kingston University, I guess. Unlike many others who find out their way into the business from other academic streams, did you always dream of becoming a production designer? How did this affinity for art and production design come from? No, not at all. I mean, I grew up in the countryside on the Welsh borders, so um just even going to art college was something that wasn't really planned i finished i was always creative and made things i grew up on a small little family farm and I, I, i'd always be making things and you know i did art gcse and uh and uh other uh design and realization design and communication but then when i was at school i did some work experience for a stonemasonry company and I was off an apprenticeship because I could just carve really well. Um, and so I was going to leave school at 16 and take up an apprenticeship um, at Bath along with this company and become a stonemason. But two weeks before I was due to start my apprenticeship, I um, an apprenticeship is where you sort of learn on the job. I don't know. You, you know I don't know if people are familiar with with, yes. with that. It's sort of you know the tried and for learning a craft, it was always the way you'd you'd learn under a master crafts person. But there is also the modern apprenticeships. There's also a, a, an element of college for for a couple of days a week, and that fell through. So two weeks before I was supposed to start, and before um, college term and school started again in September. I frantically went round with my mum looking at where I could go and get some education. So I was lucky that there in Hereford there was a, there's an art college that's an independent art college. And um it's kind of I think the only one in the West Midlands that isn't it completely independent or was at the time. And so I, I decided between doing A level and going to art college that I would probably end up going to art college. So I went to art college thinking I would then in a couple of years go and do my apprenticeship. When I was at art college, 
it was the mid 90s and all education was free in the UK back then. You didn't have to have tuition fees and you got given grants for means tested. So, you know, the course was free and then they gave you money to live. And when when I was there, the um, the head of the course said, you know, I'm hoping that one you a lot of you will go off to university and do degrees. So I went and did a degree in applied arts. Um, I was like, that's cool. I've sort of always fancied going to university, but didn't really have a route into it. And I also was really severely dyslexic. So an academic route was not really an option. And so it sort of just evolved. But I, in the background, I'd always loved movies. So, you know, my dad was a big watcher of movies and I loved movies. But um, a career in movies seemed unattain unattainable or even unachievable we didn't make a lot of movies in the uk back then it was sort of after um uh, things like train spotting happened whilst i was at university and four wins and a funeral just sort of happened as i was at college so there was there was films starting to be watched and then it was somewhere during that time at university doing my undergraduate degree where i thought mate during that time i thought i'd go off and make contemporary furniture but i realized that well not then that set design sort of became a thing people started mentioning and I hadn't really considered it before and so but all of my projects were usually revolving around Barbarella or the Avengers the TV show so there was always something that I was trying to create objects that would exist in those worlds but not ever put two and two together and then when I finished university I thought that um I would be a designer maker and then I realized pretty soon that that meant having a business setting up a business and you couldn't go and work and uh work for somebody that easily I'd have to produce the stuff and then sell it and, and growing up on a farm like the whole being a businessman thing just didn't appeal to me and so then I came back to this I or started to really consider the idea of going and working in an art department and sets and started learning a bit more about that I, I got a little bit of work experience which was very hard to do back in those days especially with no contacts had no contacts anybody who I knew or or, or knew somebody so I came to London I had two uncles that sort of lived in just outside London and I stopped with them and got some work experience and then whilst I was down down here I then made a move I was like well I need to go to London and after a year after university I went I moved to London um and during that time one of the trips I met a designer who recommended the Kingston course and so he well he looked at my portfolio I managed to get him to look at my portfolio and he's like you don't have the skill set needed to help me you, you know none of the skills you have are relevant for me for an art department. I could have probably gone and been a prop maker, but I was more interested in the design side of it. And so that whole year I spent applying, well, not applying, I, I applied and worked in an insurance company and applied. And luckily I got in and I was one of 11 on that master's degree. Um, And... I then, after I did that master's degree, which is just over a year, it's really a shame it doesn't exist anymore. Um, I started trying to get uh, work experience in, well, work in the art department, paid work. And eventually um, a designer called Melanie Allen, who had come in and given us a lecture, I rang, rang her um, and she was looking for somebody in Wales locally. I was from the Welsh borders. I lied, said I had an uncle who lived in the town that she was in and I could be local because they needed a local hire. And then I, I I figured out the rest after and I went for two weeks and ended up staying for 16 weeks. And Melanie took me under her wing and trained me up as a through the art department and I became an art director under her. So that was my formal training. You, you know, has being dyslexic ever come in your career path? Were you ever shown a way down instead of you, you, you were not able to make it to the big movies has has it has it impacted your career um i mean i never told anybody so you know i don't think melanie really knew for maybe seven or eight years of, of my career i would just keep it where i always carried a 
because now with modern smartphones it's easy i can just speak into it and it and yes. it does it you know it's it's so easy that it, it that it's not really it's not an issue um the only issues that i sometimes have is if i have a mind blank and i can't even think the first letter of, of a word you know so certain words in english that don't sound <laughs> the letters are not necessary as they sound um so uh i never really i mean through my education career I, with with writing essays and stuff then i i you know that was very productive prevalent and it was part of me but I never let it define who I was so when I started professionally I never really told anybody about it um and it also seemed like that that everybody else was pretty much like 80 percent of people with dyslexic so I was like why even mention it because it's sort of you know I, I I I didn't really see it as a thing that was anybody's other anybody's business other than mine and that wasn't because I was ashamed of it I was just comfortable with it i talk about it a bit now because i think it's useful for other people coming up through i i've i i, I was diagnosed with dyslexia when i was like five so i was really young so pretty much all my education i lived, lived with it and figured out strategies you just figure out how to deal with it it's not a big deal and it just makes your yes. brain work in different ways i think at the end of the day um my daughter is dyslexic but she can read incredibly well i mean she's read i've already said to her 10 you you know you read more than i've ever read in my life you know she's an insatiable reader um that's the only thing that is a regret is that i wasn't able to push through and read more as a as a kid i think you know by 2018 you were already an established art director in the industry and then you pivoted or shall i say you self-promoted yourself to the production designer's role is there a time when a set decorator or an art director decides that now I should market myself as a production designer or do you wait for the right moment to knock your door? I Mine was... Uh, so, yeah, it, it's interesting. I was speaking to an art director friend of mine recently who'd been offered a job as a designer and wasn't something he pursued but thought maybe he should do it. And I, and I said to him, I think, you know, I asked him some questions and he's like, well, you haven't given me a yes or no. And I'm like, only you know, only you know if it's right. Um, I was not keen to design too early because I was actually trying to make my own little films and I spent all my energies doing that because quite often you have to go and work and design for free. So I, if when short films or other projects that were kind of very low budget came my way, I would always, because um, I had been asked, I, I would I would give them to other designers, I would say recommend other people, or designers or starting out or other people I knew they wanted to design. And it was only because of my friendship with Sean Durkin, um, we met on Southcliff, um, a TV show that we did in 2012. And we became very good friends on whilst making that show. And then and, and after we stayed good friends and Matthias Elderly, the, the cinematographer, um, and the three of us were, were, were very close and, and got closer, that when Sean came to make his next movie, he, he said, you know, I want you to design my movie. And so I knew a lot about the movie. We talked about it. I'd read it. Um, I mean, you know, when he stayed at our house, and I was like, Sean, look, whatever you want me to do on this film, I'll do. You know, if you want me to be your assistant and drive you around and make your cups of tea, then I'll do that because you know it's just a, a friendship. You know, and he's a he's a great director, and so I kind of expected to just make the nest, and then go back to art directing. I was super started to supervise art directing on sort of bigger stuff. The thing that I'd done just before was Judy and um, I had a team of youngsters around me that uh, we were growing together uh, that I'd started to collect in the in the previous three or four years and we were I was growing in projects and they were growing with me and I sort of had to keep getting bigger projects because otherwise they'd all leave and and so um, so that was really fun and I presumed that we and I was able to take everybody pretty much onto the nest um, and then I thought I'd go back and art direct something reasonably big, which I kind of did some on a boy called Christmas. But I'm on the back of designing that. Matthias, Matthias uh, 
introduced me to his agent I, at first I knew about it I just got an email saying hey this is my agent so her, his agent Rebecca at Lux had been asking about who was designing the film wanted to meet me so I met and it kind of snowballed from there I met her and said look I know that some designers that I've worked for in the past have had one good film like the nest or had a filmmaker who's helped them promote them and then they've gone and worked on third series of some tv show that is not, i'm not interested in doing that because it's creatively not as fulfilling as running a big art department and 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 so um because i have a technical brain and i have a creative brain so you know the technical part of me was totally happy with running a team and problem solving and backing a designer up i was very i was a very um nurturing art director i think to my design no i would give the designer what they you know each designer is different and needs a certain some are very independent and don't need much backup others really want to a, a partner in that and you know a creative partner so um i with certain designers that i worked with i was very much a correct I, I i was a creative partner and then i also dealt with the technical stuff um so to answer your question it wasn't like there was a moment where I'm like, right, I'm going to go and become a designer now. It, it, it happened to me. And I think because I'd waited so long, it meant that I may, it may have may look like if you look at my credits, oh, wow, you just got luck. You know, you just went on this. But because I didn't jump to design too early and I say this to people, if you start jumping really early on in your career without a good grounding and understanding of the art department and all the other departments and what they need, and you go into a certain level of film, you will just be known for that level of film. And it'll be very hard to say, if you make a film with a budget of 1 million, it's very hard to break up the higher, higher, higher budgets. Even though the nest was very small, it was still of a big enough size that it was a proper art department and considered a proper fit film. So, um, but you know that's maybe for so every you know if you if you if you're interested in that kind of level of film and just want to do that then go and design that that's great you know this you see people on hundred million or plus hundred million dollars hundred fifty million dollars who supervise art directors who then become designers so it's or set decorators so it's it's it, there's no real like there's no real proper route into um, into the film then there's no proper route into designing. And one of the reasons I did the master's degree wasn't to become a production designer, it was to just get a creative job. My goal at that stage was to get a job that would pay me very blue collar, that was do a day's work and get paid, but it's a creative job in the creative industries. And that was as far as forward as I was thinking. And then once I was in it, I was like, oh, I quite like the other aspects of filmmaking. So then I started making other films and then, and 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 then all of that process has led me to where I am and meeting Yorgos and 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 then asking to to um, collaborate with Shona and so it's like everything in life. Everything it was actually feed. coming to this question. You know, collaborations are toughest part of any project. We've seen production designers sync with set decorators in many projects because there's there's obviously a project head and a subordinate relation between the two. But the dynamics change when there are actually two production designers involved in the same film. What's the chemistry between you and Shona Heath? Did you have defined roles for each other or was it a mutual collaboration? How did you guys push aside egos and respect each other's opinion and ensure a cohesive visual style for the film? I mean, that's an interesting question. I, th I think the best set decorator and design com combinations anyway are one in the same. You look at Sarah Greenwood and Katie Spencer, they're inseparable. I mean, I don't know how they break up the labor, but it seems when you speak to them, they are one entity almost. Yes. In fact, in fact, when I pitched Sarah Greenwood for the interview, she said, I'm going to give the interview, but only if Katie Spencer is also in that interview with me. Yeah, I'm not surprised because they are such a... So I think there is essentially two designers. It's just, oh, well, and there's a third person, the suit, you know, on a, a big movie, there's a supervising art director who's, who's yes. actually pretty hard done by, by not being up there when you get awarded the BAFTA or an, an Oscar and, you know, their contribution is, is massive and, and in many ways as important as the others, you know, they, 
as, as the other two. So I think it's kind of harsh that there isn't a, they don't get one. <laughs> um, so in terms of us co collaborating, I mean, I've collaborated all my professional life. I've worked most of it as an art director. And so the collaboration process, and I've worked with designers, the designers I've worked mostly with are collaborative designers. And 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 and, and so it's a bit like running a football team, I, I think, you know, or a sports team, total football, anyone can play in any position. So it's, Shona was a bit more, was very apprehensive. I was apprehensive about the fact that she didn't have any film experience and wouldn't necessarily know um what she didn't know and but she was very apprehensive about the creative part of that and so we just sat down met one another see figured out whether we liked one another which we did we really liked one another and um and we're from a similar part of the world similar kind of age so we our experiences matched a lot so we aren't weren't coming at things from a different social or a, a, a geographical point of view um so that helps we talked about what we liked and didn't like visually and we created a sort of dogma about the film and and the whole time it was pitched to us as you know you can do this week together and if you don't like one another and your ghost doesn't like what you're doing you can walk away and then there was a another concepting stage for four weeks and it's like again you can walk away so the whole time the pressure wasn't on it's like you have to make this work and you have to do this ridiculously ambitious project and the the whole time it was it was done in in such a way and it was kind of new for me in filmmaking because filmmaking is there's so much money involved compared to other disciplines or creative disciplines i think that there's a there's already a pressure to just deliver a product. You're delivering a product rather than creating an art form. I mean, you know, if you're a painter, you can paint solitary or you, but, um, and so it was done in such as in done, done in the whole process of making poor things. I mean, there is the element of running a budget in, uh, but the whole creative aspect of it was run in such a way and led by Yorgos, um, as that things can go wrong and things might not work out, but we need to experiment and try new things and try things that are maybe a bit risky that other people wouldn't try because that's the only way you're going to get something that's original by having that freedom to do that. So the pressure of it having to work wasn't there. Like there may be on other movies, you know, when you come in late, you've got to deliver this and make it photo real. So there was that time to play and shown as uh background in fashion and 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 and, and some photography leads her to think a different way to what you get you get programmed into a certain way of thinking whilst you're making films over a period of 20 years photo reel da, da, da. and so um and so we were we were good but we in terms of how we divide up the work we didn't divide up the work we didn't go you're doing this you're i'm doing that one day we'd have a bit you know I'd have a go at London next day. Shona would have a go, or a couple of days at London, did it? and then I'd go over to Lisbon, and then we would rework it, and then sometimes, and then we, Shona would rework it, and then I'd rework it, and taking the bits and, and evolving it as quickly as we could because we didn't have a lot of time. So I think it evolved very quickly. And then other days we just sit down and go through. Right, let's have a look at Baxter's house, and there's a drawing somewhere of Baxter's house with both our drawings cut up and collaged together to make this new house that we that we like yeah like that bit put that bit there to the and that's how we did it and it's I, I, that's very much how Shona runs her creative studio I, yes. I, I from what I could see and that's sort of I'm very inclusive in an art department I'm you know I want everybody to be bringing ideas and referencing and you know um so yeah we with this we have different sensibilities. We're different tech. We have different tastes, obviously, with different people. But we're also the two ends of the same thing, or two sides, or whatever the saying is. But you know, we essentially there's more in more of us in, that's in common with one another than there is that's not. You know. 
what was the prime reason that actually attracted or drew you to this project? And who was the first person to call it? Was it the Yogos who called you or was it Shona Heath who knew it first and then she was the one to call you? Uh, no, it was um, Kasha Malapan, who was the um, co-producer. Um, uh, spoke to me about the project that she'd been asked to meet Yorgos and it had this project and it was exciting. And I was like, wow, let me help you with the, um, cause we have friends together from Sh Sean Durkin's stuff. Um, let me help you with the, with the budget or constructing an art department from that. And I, and I recommended some designers like Sarah Greenwood, um, Nathan Crowley, Gary Williamson, a bunch of, um, of design, Gemma Jackson, of big time designers because I thought they'd need that. And then a few days later, she said, oh, thanks. Yeah, I could do with some help with the budget art department side. A few days later, I get another call saying, how about um, coming and meeting him? He wants to meet you. So I was like, right, OK. So then I met your goss, did a pitch, met him. And then a, a period of time went by. It's like, how do you feel about collaborating with somebody else? And I was like, well, who who would that be? Um, and he, she explained who Shona that it would be Shona, and Shona's a pretty well known designer here in the UK. Um, especially I worked with Tim Walker, and she just had an exhibition at the VNA with with Tim Walker stuff. Um, so I was like, well, that sounds. Oh, I'm not sure about that. And so at the same time, she was having a conversation with Shona. She said, "Well, I've met Shona. I think you'll get on." And so it was Kasha who put us together and made us meet. And Shona had done the same. She'd met and pitched. So he, he I think Ed Guiney had recommended me from from Elements, who's the, who's the producers of Poor Things and Yorgos has other English language movies, and also the producer of The Nest. So he'd recommend when Yorgos was going I don't want the same the usual I want to think of a new way of new people to do this not necessarily or new person and he says that he sort of always had the idea he was trying to maybe if two people would maybe be a good way to go about it he's very thoughtful in how he um selects and picks and puts um puts uh is HODs together. He very much is thinking about a team and ensemble. So um, I think the idea came from him to put two together, but he didn't really know how to do it or or who those people would be until he sort of met everybody individually. And then and then I, um, I'm not sure that I spoke to Shona on the phone or we did it via email, but we arranged to meet and I went over to her studio and met her there. Just speaking of films production design, the walls of uh, Bella's bedroom in Godwin House are hung with quilted ivory satin wedge in it. The world outside Howard is heavily influenced by Art Snowa design. How did you strike a balance between the two environments? Well, we knew that the bedroom and inside had to be a cocoon for her because she was a an infant in an adult's body. So we figured that... Baxter would have made the house safe for her. So, you know, her bedroom would be a cosy, warm place. And then also he, he put um, depicted landscapes. Um, that's based on a Victorian uh, card game called The Never Ending Landscape. And you can put any two cards together because the horizon line meets up and make a story. Yes. And you make, you make a story good. Um, and so the very thing that was put to trap him awakens her desire for the outside world because he he puts everything into the house, like there's fish on the ceiling um, and this landscape. And so the stories of, of the outside world are there for her to see and enjoy. But of course, her being an inquisitive human being wants to get out there and see these things for herself. Um, so... And then the outside, we sort of wanted to have a different story with each of the main cities. Like London was sort of grey and uh, supposed to be wet and smoggy and foggy and just very dire. Di dire because we know we weren't going to originally we weren't supposed to shoot the beginning in black and white. So we were trying to make London much more, you know, London like. So it would then pop when we got to the psychedelic colours of Lisbon and the excitement. You know, I always think Lisbon's a bit like, well, for me anyway, when I went, left school and went to college for the first time and, you know, being a 
from the, from the countryside you know you're meeting new people experiencing new things trying new, new you know listening to new music and so it's a very exciting stimulating part of your part of my life anyway personally and um and that's sort of how i always thought of lisbon in my head was that this, you know this is her point her, that moment in her life when she's let flown the nest she's you know trying to look after herself but doesn't know how to look after herself and but experiencing and meeting amazing incredible people so that was kind of you could relate her whole coming of age it's kind of a coming of age story to moments in personally in my life and i'm sure shona was doing this the same um so that's kind of what helps that sort of does influence the design too of the stages of her, her, her life um as well as the as well as just what she's going through experiencing a lot yeah you know, if i have to pinpoint one of my favorite sets from the film it will be the eyeball bridge and i'm mm. seeing this because it is so ludicrous yet so astonishing how did you go about it well that's actually a there was an illustration by a french from the french illustrate illustra illustrator i can't remember his name but we had this there was lots of imagery that we had in the research pack that um that we didn't know that was really surreal but the bridge is a, is a similar bridge but it wasn't on eyeballs it was in the clouds and there was this sort of linking you know she's going from one place so there were these surreal images we also shown had done this drawing of bella on a fish arriving in lisbon and it wasn't until we were quite far into pre-production one in, in budapest when we were talking about the links between the different parts of the movie and yorgos was like well we should do chapter headings because of these images that we kept referring back to um and so that's how the chapter headings came about and 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 one of them was this link back to london with the um with the bridge which we were suddenly like, that's the thing to do. And then Shona, um, Shona did the chapter headings actually back in London and um, and it evolved into the eyeball bridge and her coming home from being away on her travels. And she could now see, you know, there's a symbolism there, but, you know, her eyes are wide open to the world and experiences. So that, that was nice to be able to fit those more surreal images into the film. And that, our chapter headings allowed us to do that. And the bridges one, you know, the fish we made we that's a real bridge. There's a real scale bridge that's about that big. The fish was a, a scale fish that we sort of composited it all. And so all the elements were shot um uh by Robbie Ryan, the DP, and we made models and and then it was all composited together and overlaid with elements of Chris Park, who's an an artist which um is based here in the UK. He did things like Terence Malick's uh, tree of life and the he does a lot of the creation but we took people tend to just use his images as a whole we took elements of his images and overlaid them with other other images we overlaid them into the skies as well and you know any of the ships any of those kind of like mad meteorological events that are happening in any of the skies in any of the sets are probably a chris park element that union effects help lay in with the with the other kind of um clouds the clouds so were one of the trickiest things to to decide on because everybody had every one of us myself and shona had different feel feelings for that so did yorgos and so did robbie ryan the dp so actually that they took and i guess they're the thing that was last to do so they were the ones that we just went through so many iterations of skies because everyone want have felt a different thing about them um and it would have meant a very different thing for the film as well if, if you know depending on which way we'd gone some of us were more realistic than others and some of us were more surreal than others so yeah it was kind of and the movie is largely about baxter's journey and so were the sets but since the character is constantly on a move what was the director's cue on designing these extra engine architectural marvels i mean to be honest he just let us run he was like, I want it to look, he, 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 his theory was, I want it to feel like a 1930s studio movie, but not made in the thirties as if that was 
if the location revolution hadn't happened and all movies were still made on the back lot in sets so you can use technologies from today on the green screen didn't want to use green screen so led screens but you can also use painted backdrops miniatures and anything from the beginning of um of the history of movie making so and his rationale was that if you make it as if that's how movies are made today um it won't it's not going to be a pastiche to the 1930s or 50s it will be it will have its own aesthetic so that was the main kind of thing to go for and then he knew that he wanted to build it all well he to build it all obviously and then he in terms of the architecture uh, there were some paintings he gave us, you know, she, and, but they were mostly for the characters. They weren't really, uh, the, the um, Hieronymus Bosch was the only one that had any architecture in, I suppose, the Garden of Earthly Delights. Um, so we were kind of allowed to present what we, the, the versions of the worlds that we wanted to. And we were looking for the designers of their time because every architect designer, of their time is wanting to put their own stamp on it. Nobody wants to build a design of not uninteresting building. So we were looking for the kind of Baxters of their generation, the kind of free thinking, forward thinking architecture. And then we would bring details uh, into our, in, and distill them into our, um, our cities. Cause they, although they were big sets, they're still very, very small get an essence of a city so we were looking to cram as much in as we could and i think because there was two of us looking at those details we were just adding in details where we could whereas maybe if there'd just been one person overseeing it all of that there's a tendency for the kind of machine to let the sets become maybe more bland because it's easier for them to be manufactured that way it's cheaper and uh, but with two two of us at the top just pushing in detail i think it helped I, I yeah i really don't think you'd have one person would have been able to get that much detail in to it to it to the to the world because of the world's made up cities are made up with hundreds and thousands of different minds and architects and building companies and you know when it was you know so it's to try and do that with just a finite amount of people is kind of hard has there been any particular set from the film that challenged or pushed you to limits? Oh, gosh. There wasn't just one, because there were so many sets that were so tricky that there wasn't one that just, you know, normally on a film you go, yeah, that was the one. Iron Claw, it was the Sportatorium. But um, on this, they were all like Lisbon, London, Paris, the ship, Alexandria to a certain extent each one of those on a film would be the thing and so it's the combination of just trying to keep those plates juggling and, and deliver them that was the was the tricky point just delivering million pound sets every couple of weeks one after the other was was just it was relentless it was really tough going but I mean it's been worth it that's for sure. What are the other projects that you're working on? I know that you've just finished Iron Claw. I'm not seen it yet, though, but I'm looking forward to it. But what does the future hold for you? Is there any particular genre that you're eager to explore your upcoming work? And what are the upcoming films that you'd be looking forward to? So I, I am on something at the moment, but I can't. I'm not allowed to say, unfortunately. But it's going to be good. Um, did you say working with Shona again? Did you say, sorry? No, I didn't say. I said that. Is there any particular genre you're eager to explore? Oh, particular genre. Okay. Um, do you know what I really would love to do? James Bond. I would love to design James Bond. That would be. That that would be my, ultimate. I think I would, could retire then. or will go and do something else. I'd lo I'd love to do James Bond. I'd really love to do a big, big, war film. <laughs> just about that just setting up that kind of that i think the technical part of my brain would crave that love to do james bond i think i could bring something to james bond that hasn't been seen before but also i have a love for that genre um so much and i read about fiction i read fictional cold war spy i read you know um true life stuff um i did the chris files recently 
and that was that was fun to do redo that big responsibility though um uh and then the other thing i'd i'd like to do some stuff outside of film i'd i'd love to design a building piece of architecture i would really like to do that and then um i've got a couple of photography books i wouldn't mind getting published so yeah i think what i would like to you the, going forward after you know the success of poor things would be to do a couple of those film projects i'd really like but then also maybe explore avenues outside of film a little bit within design i'm very envious of shona's life that she seems to i'll be like what are you doing what are you doing at the moment every time we meet up and she's like oh, i'm just designing this mad contemporary lamp with um with these potters in stoke and you're like oh what? and you know and doing something it, it, it's i mean i love film and it's what i've devoted my life to and i'm not going to walk away from that but I, the creative part of me is like oh i'd like to just do some other stuff and a building would be amazing because you, you know i do like the the cycle of filmmaking that you design you can see and then you 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 see the death of it and then it exists in another format but but um there would be nice to build something that didn't get knocked down six months after you built it that would be kind of cool you, you also finished iron claw how was the experience directing uh, production designing that film oh and there's one other thing i want to do a bit of animation as well too i've got an animation idea that i want to do on the side because i've always i always wanted to do some animation um so iron claw well that was re we were re-teamed up together with sean and uh matthias that was our third project my second project as a production designer and we are very close as as, as a as, as a, a creative unit i would I said to them actually it'd be fun to just do some interviews together as the three of us um and we don't talk a lot i mean we talk but it's mostly about other stuff we we sort of it's very intuitive with sean we will we'll go to a place and say we're looking for a location we'll we might not ever talk whilst we're in the location we'll talk about it after or the next day and um so that was fun because it was going to the home of movie making i mean it wasn't hollywood but it was america so to go and make a movie in the american system is all is a dream come true it's also in that set in the 80s which is my memory most of of hollywood you know growing up with the great like back to the future goonies so many amazing brilliant hollywood movies made um in the 80s um so that was fun to do the fact it was a real life story though about real people with so much tragedy I, I sort of had to stop watching and reading interviews with kevin von eric because i found the responsibility of realizing their world you know if they're fictitious characters you can do what you like but there's a i find i don't know what the pain sean must have gone through the anguish because i just had to build realize the sets but he had to like tell their whole life story but um, we had, there's a lovely moment in the end of the movie where Zach, who plays Kevin, is deciding what to do with the sportatorium. And he's watching these two wrestlers in the ring wrestle or practice wrestling. They're training. And that's the real Kevin's sons. So in a beautiful moment of the only that Sean would do, he's got the real Kevin's sons. So the the Kevin on screen is watching these two wrestlers his real sons. And so him that they and um Kevin Kerry von Eric's daughters came to visit the sportatorium and they were blown away. And we actually had a ref who used to re used to ref in the real sportatorium. So I would seen him before these this was gone towards the end of the shoot. And they were blown away by they were like, oh, this, how did you know what to do it? How, how did you know how to create it just like it was? And I was like, well, there isn't that many photos. There's a little interview with Kevin. And it wasn't the same scale, but, you know, it was bigger. But it's sort of like about feeling, making, when you're dealing with sets like that, a, a feeling. And I, and whether it's poor things or, or Iron Claw, I like to create a feeling which becomes more than just a studio set. It, it's a real place. It's a tangible world. I, I like creating environments and worlds. And that's what I've always been in create interested in as a kid. And I've only just realized this, that it's about creating that whole immersive experience. And then we went into Fritz's office, which you is composite. So the composite set, you can see Fritz's office can, from the ring. He can look down at the ring and 
both the, the um, daughters started crying of Kevin's, of Kerry's. And one of them said, how did you know granddad had model airplanes on his on his desk? And Sean was like looking at me. I was like, we just figured they'd have them. You know, we didn't know and there was no record of it. We, we'd sort of seen some wall finishes and made his office. And of course that now, because they were only like four or five, maybe when they went to the sportatorium. So they wouldn't really remember what it was like. They'd just remember a feeling and a sense when they went in there. But we evoked that feeling. So every time they'll think of that place now, they'll think of the one that we've created, not the actual one, which is kind of a beautiful thing that we were able to to let them visit that in physically. I mean, they'll always be able to go and sit in a zoom, but they were physically, as adults, allowed to go and visit that 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 place where their parents had was such an important part of their parents' life. And other than all the professional work you do. What does James Price do to keep himself, you know, away from the professional life, the hassle of building sets and other things? What are your hobbies? What do you do in general? What's your day like? Martial arts, Wing Chun. I've done Wing Chun for 20 years. So um, that's fine. And the last couple of years, I've got into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I obviously don't do that as much as I'd like because, uh, because... I uh because of work so there's that and then the other thing is music I really love um music and a, f a bunch of friends and myself have started up a night that's called um soul source and it plays like rare groove northern soul funk jazz latin boogaloo and we we do those every few um every six weeks or so a couple of months we've started doing those in the last year so there's it's Martial arts, music, and movies. That's my life. I'm pretty sure that you're not planning to make your UFC debut soon. No, I'm not. No, no professional. No chance. Unless I have a midlife crisis soon and go into some kind of competition. But I just enjoy the fact that movie making is all about planning. And uh, and my whole life is always about looking forward and thinking. So to be in the moment in life is something that I don't get to do professionally, but with martial arts, you have to live in the moment. There's no thinking. As soon as you start thinking about, well, what we're doing tomorrow or later, whatever, then, you know, you, you get hit or you get tapped out or, you know, so you just have to live in the moment. And it's kind of very community. The, the bond that you have with someone for that moment is, is a bit like dance, I suppose, but it's a kind of, you're not trying to hurt yourself because I never do it. I never do it where we're trying to hurt somebody. It's it's more than mental. So I think it's good for mental ability and resilience. I don't know whether I would have been able to get through shooting poor things if I hadn't done martial arts for the previous 15, 16 years. But I'm, I'll never know that. But yeah, it's the fact that you can live in the moment. And same with playing records. It's like living a moment. So that's um, something I think we're all... I'm definitely guilty of thinking in the future and wishing the moment away because you're, oh, we just got to get to that. Or when we do, you know, you're pl constantly planning with filmmaking. So to be in my spare time, I like to just be able to live in the moment a bit. Are you are you a sports person? Do you watch cricket, football, lawn tennis? I do. I do when I have time, but it's a, it's a, it, there's a, <laughs> that you have to devote time to that. So I'm not very good at that. Um, but I do. I mean, I love football and um, and rugby at international level. Not so much cricket because cricket you do have to. I like the long format. I do like test. You like format. test, matches. but I mean, you've just got to give away over five days, so <laughs> I can't do that. Um, maybe when I retire, I watch them. <laughs> and one one last thing that I like to ask you is, what was your family's early reaction when you won that BAFTA and that Oscar? Oh, pray the the my mom mum was looking after the, my two daughters. We have two daughters, a ten, ten and twelve, and so mum when we got back about like five in the morning because we'd gone to a lot of parties was waiting up. I mean, just the joy. There's a big party being arranged for me. Well, we're off to Ireland. We, my wife is Irish tomorrow, and there's a party going to happen there with her family, and then my mum and dad are arranging a big party in may 
back home with all my school friends and my extended family. I mean, I have a massive extended family. I think there's 85 of us, aunties, uncles, and first cousins. So which part uh, which part of the world were you born? Uh Welsh borders, so North Herefordshire. Um and so the I mean actually go especially the Oscars, the fact that we won everything up to then and the amount of people that I knew that were staying up to watch over here and rooting for us, I, that was that blew my mind actually. Uh, you know, people that I've never met or not, you know, the amount of just joy it's brought other people. I love how you know, um, giving giving the Oscar to people. The airport, we jokingly said we were in duty free buying my mum a present, and Liz, my wife, said, "Oh." Um, they were trying to get us to buy more stuff. And I was like, no, no, we've treated ourselves enough recently. And this is like, oh, he's got an Oscar. Anyway, gets the Oscar. I guess, would you like to see it to the lady? So she's like, yeah, I'd love to get the Oscar out. All hell breaks loose in the duty free. I mean, we were there for 20 minutes. My card was still in the reader with, un and there were people taking photos. There was this woman from Germany, Frankfurt, live streaming on Instagram. And I thought, oh my gosh, the power it has and the joy it brings people people going can I come and have a look at the Oscar and take a photo with it it's just it's like it's not I mean it's it sits in our house but it's not mine I mean I it that's been the most amazing thing is the joy I mean the BAFTA brings people joy but the Oscar is another level it's like winning a football world cup it's and that's the only way I can quantify it because it's it's really like well what you know we don't get into filmmaking to win Oscars we get into it to make films that are brilliant and gonna live on and films that we'd want to have watched but um but just see the joy it brings people is is quite something it really is is there a thing that uh, the, these people who organize oscars actually make you sign a contract because i've heard rumors that you can't sell the oscars forward you can't you can i can leave it to somebody gift it to somebody in my will but if i want to dispose of it as they say um I have the right to the Academy via email now and they have 30 days to respond and they can buy it back for a, for a dollar. So it's a way of keeping them not fl flooding the back. I think that came in in 1950, I was reading, and before 1950, those Oscars come up for sale, I believe, sometimes. But if you've signed this contract yet, yeah, to just stop and trade in them as a, as a, as a thing. So which I think it's good. I think that's kind of the right thing to do. Otherwise, you know, you'd you'd soon, soon be selling off. And then I think also my siblings won't be able to sell it off either. They'll have to keep it. Um, but yeah. All right, James. So we are, I guess we are actually running out of time here. But I'd like to thank you for showing up for this interview. It has been an indeed a great pleasure to have you with Home Crux today. And I Brilliant. look forward to more such conversations in the future. And oh, I'm thank you. Success be good. and many more Oscars to come. Oh, thank you very much. Take care. Have a good day. Yes, have a good day. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. I can hear you, but I can't see you. You cannot see. see me. No, did you close your eyes? No, no, I didn't close my eyes. I'm able to see Speaking, I was not expecting to see you because I thought it, you're like three minutes late. I am not sure if I'm <laughs> sure or not. I know. I have, I have a habit of being just always late someone catches me and so i was scrambling to find the link and get set up so <laughs> and the other room is too noisy hang on let me just turn that light off one second that's better yeah it's better now so how's your day going it's afternoon here in india how's the uh, weather in england at the moment it's raining <laughs> it's raining yeah yeah all right then i'm just Give you a brief introduction of who I am and what I do. I okay. am. You can just adjust the camera, and whenever you want me to start, I can begin. <laughs>